I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support too. That's where Ollie comes in with their delightful, hardworking gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to this episodio especial. Laszlo Montgomery here with something extra from the CHP. This time I'm honored to present to you the two Moors, once again, Lee and Rob Moore from the Chinese Literature Podcast. You might recall I had them on the CHP way back in 2021 when we discussed Lin Yu Tang. They just started a multi part series on the life and work of Lu Xun, someone who has been queued up forever as a CHP topic. And I listened to part one of this latest CLP series and thought, well, why make everyone wait for me to get around to him? If you, by any chance, aren't yet a follower of the Chinese Literature Podcast, you might want to consider that. Great show, great insights into Chinese lit from ancient and modern times, from two people, I might add, who know what they're talking about. And to titillate everyone who hasn't yet discovered this award-winning show, I'm featuring part one of this new series they just launched, and I'm encouraging you to go check them out. The Chinese Literature Podcast can be found in all the same places who have willingly stooped to allow the likes of me on their platform, and I'll have links at the show notes. And now, here's Lee and Rob Moore to present to you an introduction to Lu Xun. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Today, we are going to begin a series that Rob and I have been wanting to do for a long time. We've got a series on Lu Xun, the supposed founder of modern Chinese literature. He's written stories. He's been a translator. He's written essays out the wazoo, just this kind of foundational figure. And we've done some podcasts on him early in our podcasting career. And then because we had done so many, Rob, I think we kind of just sort of dropped off. We dropped off, but what's interesting is that in the current political climate, a figure like Lu Xun begins to take on a lot more importance because Lu Xun is sort of the the hero, the literary hero of modern China. I remember when I was teaching in China at the university, I would always have an activity at the beginning of one of the classes where I'd have students rank in order from greatest to least great, 10 Chinese figures from history, all the way from like Lao Tzu to the the first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, up to like Jackie Chan, just, just all over the map. And every single group, without fail, put Lu Xun in the top three. He's considered this revolutionary, the voice of China, the whole thing. Well, so in our current climate, what does the voice of China sound like? And when you go back and read Lu Xun, he's such a rich and complicated writer that none of the narratives that people typically use to describe him work. And so we wanted to really, really tease that out and and study it and dig into it and not just sort of either jettison it or accept it. And we've been telegraphing that we were going to do this series for a little while. Rob, I I think that's a great way to think about what we're going to try and do with this podcast series is I don't know how much we as podcasters can revise the canon, but we're trying to rethink Lu Xun. We don't want Lu Xun to just be the same old Lu Xun that's taught in Chinese literature classes in both the U.S. and I think largely in in the PRC as well. In the PRC, Lu Xun, you use the word revolutionary. Uh, He's largely seen as this not progenitor of the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, but this kind of early figure who helped it along. And certainly Lucian was a big fan of, of a lot of socialist ideas, but he famously, he refused to join the CCP uh, and he died in 1936. We should, as we start out, we should mention he was born in 1881, died in 1936 of tuberculosis. For Mao, Lucian is really the go-to writer. And because it's Mao's go-to writer, he becomes the PRC's go-to writer. And even today, there is this very rigid way of understanding Lucian in the PRC, right, Rom? There is, but here's what's interesting about some of what's rigid about Lucian, is that it can be true if you think through it enough. So, for example, the narrative of him being revolutionary, the way he was supposed to have been revolutionary, in retrospect anyway, was that he was trying to wake China up. 
from its slumber, from its its subjugation to foreign powers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, so he's this nationalistic figure, right? Nationalistic figure. Now, it's not incorrect to say that that was one of his goals, and it's also not incorrect to say that Lu Xun still has the desire to wake people up. The question is, to what? And so that's a lot of what the series is going to be dealing with, is to say that Lu Xun did, in fact, have this as at least one of his goals, and you can still read him this way. The trick is that he's waking us up to something far more complicated than is usually understood. And the way that he is understood in the PRC and in a lot of classrooms in America is that, okay, this is how you have to understand him, and he has to fit into this box, and you cannot go outside of that box. You cannot think about him in any other way. And that's ghettoizing him in a couple of different ways. I mean, Rob, you mentioned he's oftentimes kind of talked about as the voice of China, the voice of early 20th century China. The the problem with that is that he only becomes this Chinese figure, and only Chinese folks read him. Uh, not even in Taiwan, actually. He's he's kind of ignored. He's he's not really an important figure. This politicization of Lu Xun makes him. He doesn't travel very well outside of China, and I think the reason for that is because he's been so politicized in China that you can only think about him as waking up the nation. But in fact, one of the things we're going to try and do with this series and. I don't know if we're going to accomplish it, but I want to say, you know, we should all be reading Lu Xun. We should all be thinking about him, whether or not we're interested in China. Now, this podcast is mostly folks interested in China, but I want y'all to maybe go pick up a copy of Lu Xun. We have some issues with the translations available of Lu Xun, but still go, go pick up a copy of Lu Xun. Understand him, read him alongside Joyce, read him alongside Proust understand Lu Xun as a modernist writer, not as a the voice of China. Or you can understand him as the voice of China if you want. But he's so much more than that. I would adjust that slightly and, and say that he's both. Our, our point is that like Joyce, like Proust, to some extent like Kafka, he's both the voice of a particular culture, people, and time, and also way past that. If you read, if you read Proust... You're reading France. I mean, that's it's deep into French culture and geography and everything, but it's so much bigger than that. And, and Joyce, you don't have to same carry, thing. You don't have to care about Ireland. You don't have to care about France to read Joyce and Proust. He's, you know, they're they're taught outside of that national context. Right. I think Lu Xun should be taught in modernism yes. courses in English departments. Agreed. As as their peer, every bit their peer. Uh, and what makes them all so rich is you can read Joyce as the great Irish writer. You can read Proust as the great French writer. Lucien is a great Chinese writer. Or you can go way further afield and just read them on their own purposes. And you're going to hear, dear listener, in this series from some esteemed guests. Some really, I mean, esteemed guests. <laughs> we were very fortunate with people agreeing to discuss this stuff with us about their experiences with Lucien and how... Many of them come at Lu Xun with no interest whatsoever in China, or maybe just a beginning interest, like, hey, what's this Chinese literature thing all about? And just being utterly floored by what they read. So I think that's a great point to turn away from introducing the podcast series and turn to today's discussion, which is Lu Xun as a writer, how he developed his biography, and, and briefly touch on something near and dear to Rob's heart, some of Lu Xun's earliest translations and kind of how those were developing as he was thinking about what writing is. Rob, who is Lu Xun? Lu Xun, first of all, that was not his real name. He was, he's Zhou Shuren is his name. He was the oldest of four brothers. One of his other brothers was Zhou Zoren, who was also a very famous writer in early modern China. He was born in 1881 in Zhejiang province to a scholarly family, though not necessarily a wealthy family. This is important. They had lost a lot of prestige and money over the, the past couple of decades, and whereas before they had been rich. Afterwards, you know, by the time Lu Xun is kind of hitting his stride educationally, they're getting really poor. Uh, actually, a lot like Joyce, a lot like James Joyce. Yeah, a lot like James Joyce, that's true. His father died of alcoholism when Lu Xun was 16, and this is one of the things that inspired Lu Xun to study medicine. In 1898, he entered the Jiangnan Naval Academy, 
This is an important development because a lot of scholars like Lu Xun in the late 19th century studied in institutions that were founded by Western powers or funded by the Chinese government to act like institutions founded by Western powers because they couldn't necessarily get where they wanted to go through the traditional route of the civil service exams and appointment to government office. They went into things like translation or, in Lu Xun's case, studying medicine. And at the Jiangnan Naval Academy is where he discovered Western literature. He discovered Huxley's evolution and ethics. He discovered J.S. Mill. He read Ivanhoe, things like this. After that, he went to study in Japan in 1902. It was while he was in Japan that he had what we will discuss later on in a much longer podcast was a sort of awakening, a realization that China was not where it should slash could be. He had gone to study medicine as a way to save his father or to save other people like his father, that failed, and he came to distrust traditional Chinese medicine because of it, but then also to realize something was deeply amiss, and he believed literature was the answer to that problem. If, if I remember correctly, he went to Japan thinking he was going to fix China by fixing the bodies of Chinese people, and he left Japan thinking that that was not the solution, that he had to become a doctor of the soul to fix China. And he right. thought that literature was the way to fix the souls of Chinese people. Now, thus far, this this plays pretty closely to the traditional narrative. I mean, none of this stuff is surprising. If you study Lu Xun at all, you're going to be nodding at everything we've just said. By, by traditional in, narrative, you mean the, the narrative that's taught in the PRC in, in the U.S.? Right, that traditional narrative. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about it is that it's precisely this point where if you actually read what Lu Xun thought was going to allow him to be a doctor of the soul in this period was a little bit different. What we do not have in this very early period of his career is anything like the later stories and essays that made him famous. In 1901 and 2, he produced two translations. There's a, there's a third, but it, I don't think he ever even finished it. Of Jules Verne novels. Dear Jules listener, Verne, the French guy. Yeah, the French science fiction. Around the world in 80 days, journey to the center of the earth. I, I think, regardless of what you think about Jules Verne, I think you'd have to agree that's a weird choice for the thing that's going to wake a country up. If I said, you know what you the U.S. needs today? You know what it needs, Lee? It needs some Jules Verne. So just to clarify, Rob, what you're saying is that he's in Japan, he's swirling in this series of thoughts about China and how to make China I'm going to just use the term and recognizing the politics of it, but he was thinking about how to make China great again. Eventually, he would go on to, to write these really important works that even today, when kids read Lu Xun in China and in the U.S., they go, that's making China great again. But that's not going to come till much later in his life, 1919. About a decade earlier, he starts translating Jules Verne as a way to make China great again. That's, that's more or less it. Jules Verne is not uh, the sort of writer that uh, you would think would start a revolution. It's fun science fiction. That's, that's about it. But Lu Xun saw something that he felt was super, super important. What was it that he saw? What was it that he saw? Well, that's a good question. He has a preface to his translation of From the Earth to the Moon. It's about a bunch of Civil War veterans who decide to build a cannon that can shoot a shell to the moon. Uh, Lu Xun writes a preface to this one in which he explains what he believes is, is the point. In fact, he even says, if China is to develop, it must begin with science fiction, not the rallying cry you would expect to hear if you've read Lu Xun before. But here's why. And we're not, we're not going to belabor this. I'm not going to drag you through the entire translation or anything. He has a little quote about how, wow, science is super important if we're going to be if we're going to catch up with the West, if we're going to be modern and cool. And then he says this, the common person has difficulty bearing science. And even before having finished reading, wants to drift off to sleep. The power of fiction is its ability to play the fool and allow even the most abstruse concepts to penetrate deeply into mind and sinew without causing weariness. It stimulates people's emotions and allows them to think without great effort. It eliminates superstition, reforms thought, and rescues civilization. Lee is, if you've listened to the podcast, famously not a fan of science fiction as a genre. 
I, I can I can see him reading this quote and cringing in his seat. But here's what's interesting to me about, and this is why I suggested we start with this quote, is that it, it indicates something interesting about where Lushun is starting. So remember his bio, remember where he's coming from, and remember his goal. His goal is, as Lee put it, to become the doctor of the soul, the Chinese people's soul. Now, what he's intending to do with this translation is to kind of Trojan horse science into the popular imagination. Let's just, let, let's, let's make people learn science without actually knowing they're learning science, right? Let's just, let's just get it in there. Let's just get some science in people's heads however we can, and that, that's going to do it. We're, 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 we're going to get it there. It's an incredibly simplistic idea of how to reform a country, right? All people need is a little science. We can make it fun and cool and interesting. And I think we've got it. I think we've got this nailed. All people need is a little bit of science, but it's, you know, when you give a dog a pill, you wrap it in peanut exactly. butter. So that, exactly. so science fiction is the way to get science into them. Science fiction is the peanut butter dog pill of <laughs> Lei Qing, China. That's exactly <laughs> what it is, right? It's, no, it's almost exactly what it is. He even says effectively, let's not make people think too much. The, the exact quote is is here uh, that it can penetrate deeply into mind and sinew without causing weariness. It stimulates people's emotions, and this I love this allows them to think without great effort. So they're going to think new things, but they're not going to have to try really hard. Like let's not push them too much, right? All we need is the right books, and and they're going to be good to go. I mean, he's he's kind of arguing this based off of his discussion of earlier Chinese literature. That is, yes, Chinese literature. Is, is part of the problem, he says, because it's only fiction, it's essentially told lies to the Chinese people. But because it's entertaining, they liked it. So Chinese people end up only believing lies because they enjoy the fun of fiction. So his remedy, and the way he's going to fix China's soul at this point, the way he's going to make China great again, is to give them that same amusement that comes with fiction, but teach them science that's it's just yes. such a weird kind of it's so weird and this is why i love starting here this is not the lucian you're used to if you've read lucian the idea that what lucian wants is to amuse people and get them new thoughts negative <laughs> yeah it, it's just it's weird for me because th- none of this is science right like jules verne is not really teaching i mean I, that's my understanding of jules verne's is there's very little science involved there's a ton of science in Jules Verne. Is there? Okay. Yes, there's a ton of science. Like it's mostly science. That's why it's so boring. He has entire chapters with nothing but things he culled from research in the National Archives and the, the science magazines he got. That's like So this is it. Jules Verne is kind of like Moby Dick writing about the whale and that cha- long, long chapter yeah. on... Okay. Yeah. Jules Verne was famous in, in France. He was one of the first to say, you know what? You can actually master a subject without actually studying it you can just read what really smart people wrote about it and that's totally enough and so he he had subscriptions to tons of different science journals yeah one of the things that gets that gets really wearying is that set sort of herman melville moby dick approach in in from the earth to the moon for example this group of civil war nuts u.s civil war nuts they decide to create this cannon and shoot a thing to the moon the next chapter if i remember correctly is just like a whole history of ballistics like who cares it's so boring but the important thing here is that lucian sees here aha see this is this there's something that sounds like the fiction we're used to but jules verne throws enough science into it that it's not just that right it's it's gonna feed their heads a little bit but they're still gonna have fun the the one thing I, i i want us to take away from that is that he has lucian has this almost naive faith in people's ability to be made better by what they read so you just give them a fun story with either good morals or good ideas, and they're going to change. That's all you really need to do. He really believes, or seems to believe, that if he translates Jules Verne well, he's going to knock it out of the park. I'll start wrapping this up so we don't get way too deep in the weeds, especially because our next podcast is going to be a discussion with one of the great scholars on the subject of modern China, modern Chinese literature, and that's Theodore Huters, about something else that Lucian wrote in 1908. And so we're going to leave some of our reflections for that. But for now, I want us to think about the early Lu Xun as, frankly, almost like a kid, right? He's he's being exposed to new ideas. He's he's traveling. He's realizing things for the first time. And he's coming away from this with this extremely romantic idea that if you have the right books, everything is going to get 
better. That's the Lu Shun in 1902. What this podcast and the whole series is going to try and do is we're going to try and present Lu Shun in a way that you haven't seen before. We're going to try and represent him. This this ain't your Lao Shu's Lu Shun, right? This no. is this is a Lu Shun that kind of gets buried in some of the discussions in the textbooks. My hope is that uh, folks who haven't read Lu Shun will will become more interested in him, and folks who have read Lu Shun will go back and reread him. And make sure if you're enjoying this podcast and the rest in the series, you give us a shout out on your favorite podcasting platform. Reviews are very helpful. Spotify, also look for us iTunes, Spotify, yeah, whatever you whatever you're using. Also make sure you look for us on Twitter and Instagram. We went through a real dry spell where we didn't put anything on there, but we're we're back on the horse. That's on Twitter, Chin Lit Pod, Chinese Literature Podcast, and on Instagram, Chinese Lit Pod. Tune in to make sure you can find out what's going on. And of course, we are still on Patreon at Chinese Literature Podcast. Look for us there as well. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.